He quoted Psalms earlier that as our heart pants after him, he'll fill us. One of the other Psalms talks about that, how he anoints our head with oil. And if we stay in him and truly live like all we need is him, he said he'll fill our cup to overflowing. See, we don't live in, we don't give from the cup. We give from the overflow. So lift up your hands everywhere. Father, we acknowledge you as the King of kings, as the Lord of lords. From our hearts to the heavens, Jesus, we proclaim that you are the center of our lives. It is in you that we live and move and have our being. It is through you that we have redemption, reconciliation, full access to the throne. It is because of you that we do not live in fear, for we know we have the promise of eternity. It is because of you that we love, that we have joy, and that we have peace. So truly, Father, all we need is you. So thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for peace of mind. Thank you for redemption. Thank you for defeating sin, death, and the grave. Thank you that all your promises are yes and amen. So Father, right now as we now spend this time in your word, we welcome you, Holy Spirit, to move in and out every aisle, up and down every row, minister through the power of your word. And because of your word, we thank you that every yoke is being broken, every burden is being removed, and people come into a greater revelation of who you are. Father, may the hearts rise up and may the minds be settled that you, Jesus, alone are God and that we relinquish our world to your hands so that truly you can have control. We give you the glory and the honor and the praise for the hearts and the lives that will be changed forevermore because of the power of your word, the presence of your spirit, and the love of, your, of who you are. We give you glory for it now with an expectation of a manifestation of the power of your spirit in Jesus' name. And all those that are in agreement said, amen, amen. amen. Would you just turn to three neighbors, give them a high five and says, I'm glad to see you this morning. Hallelujah. Praise God. I tell you, there's a sweet, sweet presence up here. You know, we have an awesome team that surrounds us. We do. So praise God for our band, our music department, and everybody that does what they do so that you can be blessed and receive the word of God. Amen. All right, you ready? I'm in the land of the living, right? Are you ready? All right, so this morning we're going to be talking about victory and strategies in walking in that victory. See, last week we had an awesome production. Last week, we had an awesome altar call. Last week, we had more viewership online, hey, people, online, than we've ever had. Last week, we commemorated and celebrated the most awesome happening of the human experience. What happened on this cross? And see, the cross is bare. The cave is empty. All that so that we can have victory. 
all that so that we can walk in the victory that he obtained on our behalf. The blood that was shed, the body that was broken, three days in hell, was all so that we can walk in the victory that he supplied. And that victory was supplied 2,000 years ago. So I'm coming to serve you notice that you are all wrong if you're walking around with a loser's mentality and you call Jesus your Lord and Savior. See, resurrection, some, most of the people call it Easter. It's not about your pastel outfits, the ham and the lamb that's on the table, the family gatherings, and the nice production. It's to put you in remembrance of who you are. So I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I, I was, it was pressed upon me, and God had given me this. It was actually something I kind of lived by because, you know, y'all know by now I like shoes. I like all kinds of shoes. But God gave me a little strategy some time ago, just, you know, just, just, just a little something. So we're going to talk about a strategy or, or something that will help you to remember how to obtain or walk in the victory that God has given you. So the name is Air Force One. The title is Victory, but we're going to be talking about Air Force and One. See, I got on my kicks. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 5. First John chapter 5. It's not just something cute as much as there's some power behind that when you really think about what those words mean. Being an heir, the force you have, and he having one. All right? First John chapter 5, verses 4 through 5. I'm going to read from the Passion Translation. It says, you see, Every child of God overcomes the world. For our faith is in the victorious power that triumphs over the world. So who are the world conquerors defeating his power? Those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. How many people in here believe that Jesus is the Son of God? See, you are not a conqueror because you've memorized all the scriptures. You are not a conqueror because of the degrees that you have. You are not a conqueror because of the balance that's in your checking account. You are not a conqueror because of how great life looks. You are a conqueror for simply one thing, because you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. But I bid you this question. Do you truly believe that Jesus is the Son of God to the degree of that cross? You know, I'm all about challenges. I'm an athlete. And, you know, it's easy to just coast. But it's when that person comes up on the side of you trying to take what you believe is yours that you find out that you have a fifth gear, a sixth gear. You know, I, I swam. A seventh gear. And if you're a Lamborghini, an eighth gear. Amen. That word victory there is the Greek word Nike. That's right, Nike. And it means conquest, the means of success. Conqueror. It comes from the root word nakio, which means seize. More than conqueror. The act of conquering, the act of overtaking. And then there's another word there, world. That word world is the Greek word cosmos. If it's from the root word columbio, meaning to tend or take care of, to provide for an order or arrangement. It's a system of inhabitants. In other words, what he's saying here is you see, if I was to translate this in, you know, Patricia Ease, you see every child of God overcomes the 
world's way of doing things or man's way of doing things for our faith is in the victorious overcoming power that triumphs over man's way of doing things so who are the world or or who are those who conquer man's way of doing things defeating its power who are those that uh, overcome sin's advantage in their lives is those who believe that Jesus is the son of God so when you really, <laughs> when, you, when you think of, you know, that Nike, that overcoming, that winning, even when it looks like you're losing, you winning. Any of you play chess? Ooh, it's a lost art. I grew up and my daddy made sure I knew how to play chess. We was, that was our board game. Some it was Monopoly, some it was backgammon. Mine it was chess. And every time you make a move, you're thinking about the strategy of your opponent so that you can take over their next move. So you are calculating every move they can possibly make in the next two to three moves that you might have. Jesus is the master chess player. And even if your move was a mistake, he knows how to put a blockade in there to move it in the right direction, amen? So now what is in this victory? What's in this victory? This is a strategy that we're talking about. Air Force One. The first one, air. The word air, the definition is a person legally entitled to the property or rank of another on that person's death. The next one, a person who inherits or is entitled to inherit the rank, title, position, etc. of another. I like this one. A person who legally succeeds to the place of a deceased person and assumes the rights and obligations of the deceased as the liabilities for debts or the possessory rights to property and privileges. See, as a Christian, your only debts, you have three debts. That's to love God, love yourself, and love your neighbor. Those are your debts. And in loving God, then you already know that you have access to everything because you love God because he what? First loved us. So realizing in the strategy of victory that you are an heir. Those 39 lashes with the cat of nine tails, that thorny crown, the spitting and the spewing, the, 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 the spankings or the lashings that he got with the sticks, that was all yours. So when the character said that that should have been me, but this, this, I deserve this. When he said that, I hope that pierced to every heart. Because I don't know about you, but before Christ, I worked real hard to deserve that. But the fact that the cross is bare the tomb is empty. Several hundreds of people saw him in the resurrection and saw him ascend on high. Wiped all of that away. And made me an heir. See, he became sin and he knew no sin. So what does being an heir mean? There's two things with being an heir. Number one, you get position. One of those definitions says you get position. You inherit or you assume the rights, the privilege, the ranks and the successes of an individual as they deceased. My daughter had to do a project for college and she had to trace the family tree. It's so common in many Americans because most Americans are immigrants. Huh, how about that? Leave that alone. <laughs> Most of us, our origin was by way of immigration. I don't care if you're white, black, Latina, Asian, unless you could claim some serious Native American rights. Most of us are here by way of immigration. And my daughter, in doing this project, she asked her dad and me, can you, how far can you trace back? your roots. 
and my husband could go back to his, gra his grandmother. Me and my father on both sides of the family. And he wasn't even sure about some of the situation with his grandfather. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> he said, leave that alone. That's his story to tell. <laughs> Amen. Erase that. Don't, 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 don't. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and so on my father's side, I went on Ancestry.com and looked some stuff up because I knew my grandfather's name. I knew my grandmother's first name, didn't know her maiden name. But I could only go back as far as my grandfather. But then on my mother's side, I can trace back 2,000 years. Because in Seoul, Korea, there's a cave, a sepulcher. And on that cave are written the wall, on the wall, about 2,100 years of generations as traced by the men of the families and their seed. And it was kind of sad to me, but then when I realized that I live a good life, I have all the privilege, not of my ancestors, but I have all the privilege of Jesus Christ. So I have position that's greater than any of my ancestors could have given me because of who I am in him. In fact, because I don't know, it's probably a good thing. Amen. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15 through 17. It says in the message, through the Spirit, Christ offered himself as an unblemished sacrifice, freeing us from all those dead-end efforts to make ourselves respectable so that we can live all out for God, like a will that takes effect when someone dies. The new covenant was put into action at Jesus' death. His death marked the transition from the old plan to the new one, canceling the old obligations and accompanying sins and summoning the heirs, who are the heirs? To receive the internal inheritance that was promised them. He brought together God and his people in this new way. Now, if you're anything like me, I'm like, okay, my life is pretty good. I mean, it was, it was pretty jacked up, but you know, uh, it, it wasn't as bad. So why really, and this was a real, why do some people, why do we all need salvation? See, sin is in the earth. And not everyone deserves what happens, but because evil is in the earth, it perpetuates itself. And it's like a ro rolling tumbleweed, it picks up whatever it can along with it. And after a while, we were in Europe, we were in Rome, we, were, we saw those, 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 those coliseums. Man's ways were evil. Just because you were poor, you were snatched off of the street so that you can come the victim and the bait of the lion's fight. For no other reason, because man's heart had become so evil. Now just think if Jesus didn't say, halt, you can do that if you want, but see, we don't die, we multiply. We ain't scared no more. And when he said halt, could you just imagine if he hadn't said halt at that time? Because it says, scripture says he came in the fullness of time. Man's ways was evil. Their hearts were hard. Sin was abounding, but grace abounded yet more. Could you imagine what would have been today if that had just continued to evolve? But Jesus says, nope, stop, rewind, play. See, as Christians, your social, your economic, your racial, your cultural, or your intellectual status does not matter. You have been assigned to high, dominating, conquering positions for no other reason than that you belong to Jesus Christ, who is supreme in authority. Therefore, he has given you authority. But with that authority comes some things, responsibility and benefits. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In this new position, it doesn't matter where yesterday was. He don't care what your past was. Yet last night, y'all some wild people, those that were there last night. I ain't never been so proud of some row rowdy gangsters in all my life. And that's what they said we were. They said, y'all some gospel Jesus gangsters up in here. But listen, the woman, she sang, anointed of God. And see, she talked about her addictions and how she was strung out on cocaine. Her mama was a singing gospel artist. See, it doesn't matter where you came from. 
What matters is where you are in Christ. So God doesn't deal with where you came from because that cross paid for that. That cross redeemed that. That cross forgot that. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 through 18, he says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. All things are of God who hath reconciled us back to himself by Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. You all, in that redemption, became ministers of reconciliation. You became empowered and anointed and appointed to minister Jesus because of how good he's been to you. So if your past haunts you, it's only because, and this is not an issue of insensitivity. People have suffered trauma, but listen, if your past is haunting you and, 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 it's, and it's keeping you someplace that you don't want to be, it's because you haven't fully received the adoption of our Father, who's rewritten your history. No, forget that he's rewritten your future and delivered you from your history. So who you were before Christ is not an issue to him. So guess what, truly, you ain't got to be broke no more. You ain't got to be poor no more. What's that song? Yeah, some of y'all know that song. You don't have to be confused no more. You don't have to have any of that mess anymore. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30 and 31 in the Passion Translation, it says, it is not from man that we draw our life, but from God. As we are being joined to Jesus, the anointed one. And now he is our God-given wisdom, our virtue, our holiness, and our redemption. And this fulfilled what is written. If anyone boasts, let him boast only in, that the, in all that the Lord has done. See, Jesus did not come to make bad people good. Jesus came to make dead people live. Because... Don't get it twisted. There's a lot of good people going straight to hell. And see, what is this about? This, uh, this is about, if we go back to where we were in Hebrews chapter 9, God's way of doing things. That's what causes dead people to live. Having been a conqueror, if you're trying to do things the way the world does things, you're in the loser's run. You're on the losing team. But when we take on God's way of doing things, all I need is you, Lord, is you, Lord. We walk in the fullness of being more than conquerors. Number two, we get promises. Being an heir gives us a new position, but it gives us new promises. New promises, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. It says, for all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen, unto the glory of God by us. Listen. He gets glory when we walk in his promises. He doesn't have to toil. He's not trying to hold back nothing. He gets glory. He wants to give it to you. Check this. He has given it to you. He has given it to you. He has given you everything that pertains unto life and godliness. And all we got to do is take it. Third John, verse one, uh, uh, one, the second verse, it says, Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper, be in health, and even as your soul prospers. He says, I want you to be on top. I want you to be the, on the winning team. I want you to be the conqueror. I want you to be the grand champion in everything about you, in the money you make, and the health that you have, and the relationships that you have. I want you to be on top. He says here in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 4, I love this in the Passion Translation. Everything we could ever need for life and complete devotion to God has already been deposited in us by his divine power. For all this was lavished upon us through the rich experience of what? Knowing him. Who has called us by the name, by name, and invited us to come in through a glorious manifestation of his goodness. As a result of this, he has given you magnificent promises that are beyond all price. So that through the power of these tremendous powers, promises, you can experience partnership with the divine nature by which you have escaped the corrupt desires that are of the world. See, when you chasten the world, you're limiting yourself. 
When you're chasing God, you're limitless. See, understand this. He says, I've given you everything. I've given you everything. So why am I in debt? Why do I need a new transmission? Why am I? The everything is God's way of doing things. The everything is knowing him. And that stuff will fall in place. It will fall in place. I've been that person. I've lived that life. Like, God, where you at now? I'm living in my car. Thank God it was for, th you know, two and a half days. But I'm living in my car. <laughs> where you at? I'm pursuing you. I'm down here in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, in the Bible Belt. Where you at? And I got a check right there. I'm right here. Where you at? I did. I did. And I just prayed and I shut my mouth, got a call. Patty, I need for, is there a Western Union near you? Yeah. Where at? Down the street. I need you to go to that Western Union. I put some money in there for you. He had been trying to get in touch with me. You know, this was before the, the you know, convenient cell phones. Been trying to get in touch with me for a minute. I'm living in my car for two days. And what he gave me, what God had dealt with him to put in, was the exact number I needed. So in being an heir, you get what? Position, and you get promises. The next part, force. We're talking about strategies and walking in this victory. Force. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 17, and the King James says, For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength while that all, at all while the testator liveth. See, Jesus came and spent his three, month, three years on the earth to teach us and to instruct us and to leave an example for us. But when he left this here cross, he says, I'm dying so that now you can walk in everything that I've told you. He died so that this position and power could be ours, and he came back to make sure that we knew it was true. So number three, under force. We're talking about strategies. The strategy is air, force, one. But there are things that you get within each one of those strategies. So now we're on force. The third one is, and it's, this is not in your notes because I, you know, just me. Privileges, passion, and power. You get privilege, passion, and power, all in one. It's one thing to be an heir. I was looking at the, all these video clips because I wanted to find a cute video clip to show y'all. I didn't like any of them. But it was amazing to me how many news articles and video clips were of people who left millions of dollars unclaimed in inheritance. It's one thing to win a battle, but baby, you got to go in and seize the land. You got to take what's yours. I can, I, can, I can win something all day long, but it's worth, what's the winning if I didn't get the prize? Amen? And it's even more of a delight when, I, when someone left it for me. When someone left it for me with the instructions on how to walk in it. Matthew chapter 11, verse 12, it says, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. I quoted this my whole life, and I didn't get the double-edged meaning of what this scripture says. When he says here, because he's talking about John the Baptist, the whole entire section is about how John sends a messenger, tells him, hey, are you the anointed one? And then Jesus was like, yeah, yeah, but, but, or should we look for another? Jesus was like, uh, he never even answered the question, to be honest with you. He just went on to glorify John, how great John was in his ministry. But then he says within there, he says, since John's been on the earth, the kingdom of God suffereth violence, but the violent take it by force. See, there's two meanings to that. The first meaning is while Jesus was yet alive. The second meaning is after Jesus died. See, the, there's, the revelation in God's word is layered. The first meaning, he says, the kingdom of heaven, since the days of John, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. What was John doing? John was preaching repentance of sin. And since the, it says, since the ministry of John, John had been in ministry for about two and a half years. And it just says, since that two and a half years, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence. What's the kingdom of heaven? We already talked about it. God's way of doing things. 
He's saying people trying to get a latch on to God's way of doing things. People who didn't deserve it. Non-Jews are trying to get in on God's way of doing things. The people are trying to get in on the repentance of sin. People are trying to get in on being good with God. People are trying to be a part of this elite population of people. Suffereth violence. That word violence is the passion. It's passion, fervor. And he says then, but the violent take it by force. In other words, what he's saying there is that they wanted it so bad that they were willing to take it even though they weren't yet heirs. They're willing to take it. And that's all he says about it. But see, this other side of this here, this here statement, Jesus later on says in Luke chapter 16, verse 16, the Passion Translation, Now the law of Moses and the revelation of the prophets have prepared you for the arrival of the kingdom realm announced by John. And now, when this wonderful news of God's kingdom realm is preached, people's hearts burn with extreme passion to press in and receive it. So in other words, these are two very connected verses. So the other side of this that now that Jesus has come, guess what? You're automatically an heir. So you don't have to take it by force because he's already given it to you. So see, you ought to have passion in pursuit of the kingdom of God. But see, we get the kingdom of God mixed up with the blessings of God. When you get the kingdom of God, the blessings of God are there. So we don't take back our finances. We don't take back our healing. We don't take back our family. It's been given to us. What we take now is what we need. We take joy. We take hope. We take peace. We take love because that's the kingdom of heaven. I'm trying to learn you something. You get power, privileges, and passion in this force. When he came to make sure it happens, he's given you a force by which you automatically can claim your ticket. Give your ticket. This is my Jesus ticket. Now just give me my healing. Here's my Jesus ticket. Give me my favor. This is my Jesus ticket. But you got the ticket by way of your time in his word by way of you living the kingdom of God. 2 Corinthians verse 6, verses 2 and 3 says, Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that you will judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? He is expecting that you discern the kingdom of heaven versus the world's way of doing things. Understand, you're not judging people, but you're judging the stuff. Mark chapter 16, he gives us this great commission to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I'm, I'm quoting it, and I'm saying out of reference, paraphrasing. And these signs, signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they'll cast out devils. In my name they'll speak with new tongues. And they'll take up serpents. And if they drink any th deadly things, it shall not hurt them. We don't get into what this is actually saying, but he says these are the things that people would do in the name of other gods. But he says you will spit on other gods because you are part of my kingdom. What are the other gods today? Money, fame, popularity. You'd be amazed at what people will do for acceptance and it can become our God. And finally he says in 2 Corinthians verse 15, I'll paraphrase it, he says, he talks about you don't have to be scared of nothing no more. For when that which is mortal puts on immortality and now decay is exchanged, for what will never decay, then the scripture is fulfilled in that it says, death is swallowed up by the triumph of victory. That's that same word, victory. Death, tell me, where's your sting? Where's your power? But we thank God for giving us the victory. There's that word again, Nike, as conquerors through our Lord Jesus, the anointed one. So loved ones, stand firm and secure. The third one, one. W-O-N. He won it. He did it. All that's that we were talking about is you walking in what he's already done. 
Psalms 20, verse 7 in the Passion says, Some find their strength in weapons and wisdom. This is David talking. He's prophesying to the end, end days in his circumstance. But my miracle deliverance can never be won by men. Our boast is in our Lord, our God, who makes us strong and gives us victory. See, in this being one, we now have the last one, peace. We have peace. John 16, 33 says, These things have I spoken to you, that you might have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, because I've overcome. There's that word again, Nikeo, the world. See, peace is that being at one again, that prosperity, that rest. But tribulation means pressure, anguish, and burden. See, in the world, there is anguish, pressure, and burden. We have to live in the world, so you might experience a little bit of that. But then we check into your citizenship and your heir, your lineage, then you know that you've overcome that in who you are. John chapter 14, verse 26, he says it like this. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Now as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. See, when you realize the victory that you have from that cross, from that grave, from this resurrection, from his resurrection and his ascension on high, when you realize the victory that you have, realizing that you are an heir, being an heir means I have position. I am somebody. It doesn't matter what my last name is. My first name is Christian. It don't matter if you know me because my name is written in the book of life. And so with that, I have promises. You don't control where I go, Job. Job, you're not my, 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 my provision. You've just been honored to be a vessel of my provision. And, I've been, and you've been blessed by my commitment to Christ to be here and serve in excellence. I've been given force. I've, it's been enforced on my behalf. So therefore, I have privileges. I have power. I have all that I need. I know that my passion is in the kingdom of God. And I know because of that, I have everything and I can receive everything that he has provided for me. With that I, when I realize that I'm a winner, I've, uh, he's already won for me, I have peace. That peace that passes all understanding. I love the way John, when, when Jesus is talking and he says, I leave you this comforter. And see, this comforter is that aid, that smeared on ability, that anointed one who's not only in you but upon you, who accesses everything from the throne room into your spirit. Sometimes you'll do things and not even realize how you got there. Many of us have degrees, and we ain't working nowhere in our degree. And loving what we're doing. Because we somehow ended up in a passion. God divinely orchestrated our steps to lead us to where he would want us to be. And because of that, we have peace. We don't have to live in fear. We don't have to live in doubt. In fact, 1 John 4 talks about that he who... Uh, knows the love of God, I'm paraphrasing, does not live in fear because fear with it brings torment, guilt, and shame. And see, so who you were and what you did, it may come with some consequences, but God is so divine, he's so merciful, and he's so grateful, he can not only deliver you, deliver you out of the consequence, but because of who he is, he'll use the consequence to bless others through you. And therein can you be ministers. It's when we want to keep these secrets because we want people to think that we were born perfect and we wear our masks so elegant. Let me, let me tell you something. I'm raggedy. My parents reminded me all, my, all the time, baby, your first bed in America was a pile of dirty clothes in a laundry basket with, some, with a sheet draped on top because they couldn't afford a bed. I was born raggedy. I lived raggedy. 
I have raggedy days today, but it's through him that he's made me glorious. That he's surrounded me by awesome people. See, there's this illustration of the butterfly. And I want you to just, how many of you are familiar with the cocoon and the butterfly? You've seen one before, especially if you've been down here. And see, the little boy comes upon this cocoon. And he looks at the cocoon and he's bewildered because inside of the cocoon, he can see that the caterpillar or the butterfly, he can see that the butterfly has developed some wings and that it's starting to look pretty. But in its pretty, he sees that it's struggling inside of the cocoon. And so he takes it upon himself to say, I'm going to help this little butterfly come out and be beautiful and flutter. So he cuts over, open the cocoon so delicately. And the butterfly comes out. And for a moment, it seems like it's going to flourish. But then after a few moments, the butterfly dies. And then... He goes get his papa, and his papa, his papa is like, Dad, Dad, Papa, what happened? What happened? His grandfather. He says, You see, son, the butterfly goes through a process. And even though at the end it looks like it might have been finished, struggling in that cocoon made the blood vessels go through the outer skirts of the wings. So he needed to struggle a little bit so that he will be strengthened when he came out. He needed to struggle so that he can get himself out so that he could then fly. And so he says, so sometimes it seems like he's struggling. But see, seeming like the, strugg the, the struggle that seems is actually the strengthening that's happening. I love it the way John... 14, John puts it in chapter 14, 27 in the Message Bible. God says it like this. Jesus tells them at the end, see, I don't leave you the way you're used to being left, feeling abandoned, bereft. So don't be upset and don't be distraught. He later goes on to say, because I'm always with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. Did you get anything out of that? So I bet you'll never look at Air Force Ones the same, huh? <laughs> Whatever you're going through, and some of you are in a very dangerous position. You ain't going through nothing. Life is good. And that's when you need to brace for the next step in life. I just got to telling somebody, I'm living my best life right now. Things are great. We're believing God for some things, but life is great. And then Holy Spirit was like, no, you still got to armor and, and get to practicing. Don't ever get comfortable. The other side of that, he says, your passion, you need to be very, very passionate, very zealous. I mean, about worn out pursuing the things of God so that you can continue to have that funnel over here to receive the blessings of God. Amen. So I want to do just that. Whatever you're going through or whatever you're not going through, there is a Lord and a Savior that wants to give you so much more that wants to deliver you out of where you are and take you to somewhere even better. There's a Jesus. There's a God. There's a big brother. There's a redeemer. There's a healer. There's a counselor. There's a peace. There's a joy that wants to live big in you and with you. So while everyone is searching their hearts right now, where everyone is in an attitude of prayer, I would love to be that extension of ensuring your inheritance. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you're not sure. You couldn't open up that Bible and show anybody how I know that I am saved. Like I said, there's a lot of good people going to hell. But listen, 
It doesn't matter where you came from. Jesus says, I'm here. And all you need to do is believe that I am the son of the living God. So if you have not received Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, I want to pray with and for you. Would you allow me to do that? Or perhaps you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Many of us have. But we've lived life contrary to what we committed to. We know that we're not in fellowship. We know that we're not living a, a good life. We know that things aren't right because of our disobedience. That was me. The first time I got saved, I just said, okay, that was good, and went on living my life, only to realize that I took for granted that decision that I made. Some people call it being backslidden. We just simply call it being out of fellowship because God says, I am forever married to you, and no man can pluck you out of my hand once I got you. So I believe the Holy Spirit is beckoning you now, saying, baby girl, baby boy, I'm not mad at you. I love you. I'm not taking anything from you. I'm trying to get it to you. I'm not trying to harm you or punish you. I'm trying to restore you. And if you're in the sound of my voice, whether online or here in this worship center, God is extending his right hand to you, restoring you back to the place of fellowship with him. And if that's you, would you allow me to pray with and for you?